everybody. Today we'll be talking about an introduction to scientific thinking. So what is science? The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as a branch of study which is concerned either with a connected body of demonstrated truths or with observed facts systematically classified and more or less colligated by being brought under general laws which includes trustworthy methods for the discovery of new truth within its own domain. So that's a pretty complicated way of saying that science is a way of collecting knowledge in a principled fashion. It's a way of bringing together the ways that humans understand the world using consistent processes that are reliable. So there are a variety of ways that you might think about knowledge, what is supposedly that science is, is uh, meant to accumulate. Um, you can think about it as being something that's acquired, where it's like money and you can gather, uh, gather it together and store it up. You can also think about it as something that's built, so that your understanding is assembled over time. There are a variety of other metaphors that could be used for it as well. So William Butler, Butler Yeats talked about, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. So when you take a scientific approach, it's trying to understand the world in a rigorous and data-based way. And here I want to make a distinction between data and information. So data are measurements of the world. Um, data is plural, the singular of data is a datum. Information, on the other hand, is created when data are organized or presented in a specific way. And this is an important distinction because data is not inherently understandable by people necessarily, but information is something that is designed to be understood by people. It's a collection of data in a way that makes it possible for people to understand it. So the scientific method, which is one key aspect of, of a great deal of science, involves the following steps. So first, you construct a hypothesis based on some experience of the world or background research you've done, trying to figure out how you think the world is. The next step is you test that with an experiment. So you create an experiment that tries to isolate the aspect of your hypothesis in a way that allows you to, to, uh, to assess them effectively. The third step is you analyze the results, and the final step is you either report your results if you found something interesting, or you go back to step one and construct a new hypothesis based on, uh, based on your findings. Ultimately, the, the scientific method is only used by some sciences. There are lots of others that focus more on observation or field-based studies, things like astronomy and archaeology, where you can't effectively do a scientific, uh, uh, an experiment using the scientific method on the lifestyle of the uh, pteranodon, for example. There are a variety of different limitations on the scientific method. So, for example, the one that I just mentioned, some phenomena may not be measurable. Something that happened in the past, the distant past, you can't measure it. Other experiments may not be ethical. Uh, you could potentially do a study about climate change, but if it, if it works out that what you've done is make the world worse, that's a problem. Some other ones may be difficult because the data is obfuscated or unusable because of some kind of interference. So for example, in archaeology, if some people have built a road across the place that you're trying to look, that can change the, uh, change the data that you might, uh, might try to assess. Ultimately, though, the value of science is that it allows for a principled way of understanding the world, which is a really important aspect of how humans engage with the world around us. A question, though, that often comes up is, is the relationship between science and culture. Because on the one hand, you could say science is part of culture, that we have this culture that surrounds us, and one of the aspects of that culture is the idea of science. On the other hand, you could think that culture is part of science, that when you have, um, when you have a scientific approach, you can study culture and learn about it using, uh, using scientific methods. Ultimately, though, it may be that both of those are significant, that science is part of culture and culture is part of science, and together they, they form the, the world around us. Another relationship is the relationship between science and technology. So science comes from a Latin word, skio, meaning to know, and technology comes from a Greek word, techne, meaning craft. And so the difference between science and technology, science is about knowing and technology is about making things. Ultimately though, with, with both science and technology, there's an important role for human values that sets the course for what science and technology should be 
uh, should be exploring, what science should be learning about, and what technology should be making. And so that's one thing that's important to consider in the context of this class, is what are the human values that we're trying to, um, trying to enact in the world through our science and technology efforts. This course takes a multidisciplinary approach to understanding. Um, many of you come from different disciplines. There are, there are dozens of different majors represented by the students in this class. And each of you brings to bear a different set of expertise on the same set of problems. This leads to a particular challenge, which is the relationship among different disciplines. Because different disciplines have different languages that they use, different techniques that they use to explore the world, different standards of what counts as good scholarship, and different assumptions that are shared within a, a particular group but not shared across groups. And this leads, on the one hand, to some real challenges when you have people from different disciplines who are trying to work together, because uh, you know different people have may think the same word means two different things. It also, though, leads to some really interesting possibilities, because exploring why one discipline uses one set of methodologies and another discipline uses another one can allow for some really interesting explorations. For example, when you apply the techniques from one discipline to the concept domains of another discipline. Another point that's uh, very relevant to a lot of the ways we'll be, we'll be thinking about in this class is the idea of a taxonomy. So a taxonomy is a classification structure that is arranged in a hierarchy. So for example, if we were going to have a taxonomy of the students in this class, there are a variety of ways you could sort them. You could start off by saying, we're going to take the different campuses and say the first level will be distinguishing between the nine campuses. And then within that would split students out by major. And then within that would split them out by the year, and then, for example, would split them out by alphabetically by their last name. But there are some other ways that make it trickier to, um, that would be trickier to, to make a taxonomy. So, for example, sorting students by their actual graduation date would be difficult right now because some of you may take an extra year, some of you may finish quickly, some of you may not finish at all. And so that would be something where it would be difficult to form a taxonomy with that as one of the distinguishing criteria. Alternately, distinguishing students by, for example, enthusiasm for this course is difficult because how do you measure it? It's difficult to pin down whether student A's enthusiasm is greater or less than student B's enthusiasm. So here we see uh, a particular taxonomy. This is called the Thomson Reuters Business Classification. And this is just a subset of it. But we can see that technology is broken down into technology equipment versus software and IT services. And each one of those is broken down uh, into finer and finer detail. But this is an example of a taxonomy being used out in the world. Similarly, here's one from the Federal Aviation Administration, which is describing a human factors analysis um, and classification system is what it's called. And it says that unsafe acts are broken down into, on the one hand, errors, and on the other hand, violations. And errors are broken down into decision errors and skill-based errors and perceptual errors. And violations are, um, are red line and exceptional. And so these this is how the FAA thinks about all of the different things that can go wrong in its domain. So the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about taxonomies here is to talk about the taxonomies that might be relevant to sustainability issues that we're discussing in this class. So for example, the kinds of issues that are relevant are pollution and overpopulation and the loss of biodiversity and the disruption of the global climate and uh, rising of sea levels and the acidification of our oceans, and poverty, and war, and animal suffering. These are all different topics that relate to this domain. And you can imagine there are a variety of different ways to classify these topics. You can distinguish ones that have to do with um, living things versus not, so biotic versus abiotic. You could sort them by importance, but here you have a challenge of who's decreeing which one is more important. You could have urgency, which one has the most time pressure on it. You could do it by a time horizon, whether they're things that happen over a narrow time horizon or a longer one. You can sort them geographically. Some things happen in one place and some happen in another. And throughout this course, we'd like to encourage you to consider the taxonomies that you implicitly use when you're thinking about the world. All of you have implicit taxonomies about how you understand the world around you. And I'd like you to consider the impact that they have on your thinking because the taxonomies you use very strongly color the ways in which you understand the world. We'd also like you to think about ways that other people classify the world, how other students in the class do it, how other people around the world, how uh, we, the teaching staff, do it, and think about whether or not they're compatible, whether they're compatible with each other, whether somebody else is compatible with yours. And when you see one of these conflicts between the taxonomies people use, 
try to think about which one is better than the other one. And consider potentially, if you find one that's better than the one that you think about, think about how you can change yours. Because ultimately that's one of the important things that happens in education, is you learn about other ways of understanding the world, and gradually you adopt them into the way that you understand the world. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, this ends the introduction to scientific thinking lecture.